Welcome to ETSU Department of Psychiatry Grand Rounds. Dr. Reagan Gillies for our presenter today. He's one of our chief residents, fourth year resident. Dr. Gilly got his BS in Biology, Chemistry, and History in May 2009 at Western Kentucky University, graduated summa cum laude, and is an honors college graduate. He got his MD at University of Louisville School of Medicine. He did the Trover, or Trover Rural Track Scholar in May of 2013. He's been one of our residents um, since then. He is going to do a sleep medicine fellowship at Dartmouth following graduation here. Uh, Dr. Gilly. Thanks, sir. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Excellent. All right. So welcome. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, my topic uh, today is on surgical applications in psychiatry. So getting, getting started, making sure I know I can move the slide forward. Um, just a couple of initial things, no financial disclosures. This uh, talk will discuss investigational approaches. And just as a heads up as well, we will be reviewing some footage uh, of such surgical procedures and images from that. So a couple things to get us started. Uh, psychosurgery, as it's historically been called, has more recently moved to the term neurosurgical treatment for psychiatric disorders. These are used interchangeably. I think most interestingly about this uh, is it helps basically uh, highlight some of the functional neuroanatomy, the neural correlates of psychopathology. Um, that we have, it serves as, we will see, a bit of a cautionary tale in terms of new procedures um, really taking off without too much evidence uh, initially, as well as what we'll see with some of the more modern approaches. Uh, not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, there is some improvement uh, that we can get uh, in certain selected patients. So talking a bit about uh, the history and the historical context of this procedure, um, if we go way back in time, to pre-modern pre -modern times, uh, the use of trepanning uh, has been done uh, for a very long time. This is a surgical procedure uh, used to remove the skull, to expose the, the dura, um, and as a means of accessing you know, the underlying uh, brain. Uh, if we look at the historical record, this goes back as far as about 6500 BCE, so for a very long time. Uh, in many pre-modern um, and even pre-history societies. Uh, it's been postulated in large amounts for different reasons. Uh, common ones given is perhaps some form of, of magic or ritualistic use, some sort of ceremonial form for when people have died. Um, also perhaps postulated to be used if, uh, say, someone was injured while hunting in some form of warfare as a, as a way of dealing with uh, head trauma. Uh, looking at some of these prehistorical findings, on the left we see uh, this instrument called a tumi um, from pre-Incan society, and on the top right we see essentially uh, the outcome for when a tumi is used for uh, trepanning. Now over time, moving from prehistory to more recent times, including the Renaissance, uh, it was used to help with, or thought to help with things like seizures, again head trauma, a psychiatric illness uh, at that time often referred to things like demonic possession. It has inspired over time a number of art, as well as we see in the top right, uh, interesting advertisements on the left, and again, keeping in mind the results of this outcome that we see in the bottom right with the skull here. Um, footage, uh, something that looks like this, is as we see here as a, just a short little clip uh, from sometime in the 1920s, that we have essentially uh, the patient there, eyes being covered for, of course, good procedure, I'm sure, and um, the drill actually going in, into the brain. So this is, this is essentially the procedure that was used for millennia and builds the foundation that we're about to go on to talk about the origins of sort of modern psychosurgical uh, approaches and treatment. To get an idea in terms of the context for this, uh, we should talk a bit about the growth of silence. So these are things that uh, came about uh, really in 17, 18, 1900s, both in uh, continental Europe, the UK, uh, and the US. The picture here on the right is East State Hospital in uh, Virginia. That is the, the first such asylum here. Um, and as I think everybody knows, these are places where people with the most uh, generally refractory chronic mental illness showed up where there were no treatments. Uh, available for, for such folks. Uh, 
you know, in Europe, I think names like Bedlam probably will ring a bell for some in terms of, of asylums. Um, and so in the context of, of the growth of these asylums, um, we have a Dr. Burkhart. He's a Swiss neuropsychiatrist born in the 1800s who uh, became head of a, of a Swiss uh, asylum. He became very interested in the overlap between neuroanatomy, psychophysiology, sort of functional, uh, functional anatomy, as it were. And what he was, was empowered by through his career uh, was the, uh, the findings of what he called these cortical dispersion centers. So Broca's finding, for instance, on language centers in the brain. Um, and that he began to hypothesize, well, there are likely such centers that play a role for neuropsychiatric functioning. His, his theoretical foundation came out to basically three core points. One, that mental illness has an underlying neuroanatomic basis. These areas function as modules, carrying out specific functions, and the information from each module is connected to another module by way of essentially a, a connecting system. What he essentially said dysfunction then would arise. Psychopathology would arise from dysfunction of either the module itself or uh, from an aberrant connection. And what he came from this foundation to two basic conclusions. Perhaps there could be alleviation of, of essentially psychiatric pathology by either disruption of the connections or disruption of the modules doing the actual processing. Uh, his, his hospital in Switzerland, I was able to find a picture here. This is from around 1918. Um, so he was back at the, the end of the 1800s, and he's the one who performs the first real modern psychosurgical intervention. It occurs in December of 1888. He performs this on six patients. So we can see four men, two women, ages from kind of mid-20s to early 50s, all who had been there um, chronically for intractable symptoms, uh, that he described as auditory hallucinations, paranoid delusions, aggression, uh, violence, and uh, also chronic excitement. More modern interpretation of these diagnoses, as far as I, I've been able to find, would be things such as chronic mania, various forms of dementia, neurocognitive decline, as well as paranoid uh, psychosis. So taking, taking these, these individuals, um, he performed the procedure itself. Keeping again in mind, he had no formal surgical training. So what he did through trepanning, uh, opening up the skull, he excised areas of the frontal, parietal, and temporal cortices uh, in, these, in these individuals. The outcome, as it was later described functionally, was, quote, not overly encouraging, end quote. Unfortunately, an individual died five days uh, after the procedure from convulsions. Another initially improved, but later completed suicide, two with no change, two became quieter. Keeping a notion on the, the idea of quieting, there were several complications, adverse effects from this procedure as well. Two patients developed epilepsy, one with motor weakness, another uh, what was described as word deafness and thought to be a form of, of sensory aphasia. Only two of these individuals uh, had no complications. And I was unable to find if these were also the two who had become quieter, or if perhaps the quieting may have become from one of the other adverse effects from the procedure. Nonetheless, Burkhart, being empowered by what he found, uh, publishes in 1889. And when it is put out, when he presents at, uh, at various conferences, it is near universally condemned. So given the negative reception, he does not make uh, any further uh, psychosurgical interventions. A quote that uh, he said is essentially this, that I think provides a good idea of his context and of his, of his thought process. Essentially this, there are two types of doctors. The first, do no harm. The second, it is better to do something than nothing. And that he would say he certainly belongs to the second category. So, this is the end of, of the 1800s. If we move on to the 19th, uh, 1900s, 20th century, uh, to the 1930s. Two researchers at Yale, uh, Dr. Carlisle Jacobson, a research psychologist, Dr. John Fulton, a, a neurologist, um, as, as a sort of best description, who had been working with primates on researching frontal lobe functionality. What they found uh, in their group of chimpanzees, uh, 
thought quite interesting, described it, the behavior of the time as neurotic at baseline with a couple of these chimpanzees. Throwing, uh, as maybe we can see, temper tantrums, as they were described, defecating, urinating, throwing themselves on the floor when they were given uh, basically task to perform. Um, so what they decided to do was to go in and experimentally resect uh, portions of their frontal lobes. One chimpanzee, Lucy, we see in the picture here with Dr. Fulm, um, was described as being calmed afterwards. She was able to participate in testing without any difficulty. And this quote here at the bottom I thought quite interesting. Devoid of any emotional expression and no longer capable of the arousal of the frustrational behavior she had displayed before uh, this operation. Now, they take their results to the second International Neurological Conference that's held in the summer uh, of 1935 in London, where there's a full day's uh, worth of presentations and discussions on frontal lobe functionality. Uh, they present their results there, where they go into a little more detail, talking there were no behavioral or intellectual deficits that they found after testing from the, the frontal lobe resection. Noted again, their experimental anxiety was far lessened, and I think quite interesting as well, uh, Jakeson later writes about one of the chips who, such a personality change that the chimp had joined the happiness cult afterwards. Now, at the at this same conference, we, we enter another of our key players, uh, Dr. Antonio Moniz. He is a Portuguese neurologist, uh, had been involved with Portuguese political affairs, as well as very well known in the medical community at this time for development of cerebral angiography. He becomes very interested in functional neuroanatomy and the overlap with psychopathology, and as, as fate has it, attended this talk by uh, Fulton and Jacobson. It is said there that there is some disagreement that he made a, a question of a bit about of a translational inquiry. Could this or had the, these two researchers ever thought of using such a procedure in humans? Some reports say he didn't ask that, some do. Uh, the ones that do, uh, do make for an interesting story. As they say, the response was that they were taken aback. They said, of course not. This is still early in its infancy. Um, though Moniz later states and, and writes that he had been thinking about such a procedure or psychosurgical intervention uh, for a period of at least multiple months before attending this conference. So regardless of which source we, we go with, uh, he does say later on, this had been something he had been putting considerable thought into. So what he does when he returns back to Portugal is in November 1935, so a few months later, he takes four patients, two uh, who have chronic depression, another two with paranoid schizophrenia, and through uh, trepanning, opens up the skull, and takes uh, alcohol, dehydrated alcohol, injects it into the uh, kind of subfrontal white matter tracts, again, uh, targeting what we now understand as the kind of frontothalamic, frontolimbic uh, connections. He, as we will see in the next slide, very heartened by um, what he discovered, and within the next year performs this on 20 patients in total. What he found, as he would later write about it and publish, I think quite, uh, quite a, a big point of emphasis as well, there were no deaths, as he said. He wrote the intervention itself is harmless. He also wrote none of the patients became worse after the procedure and wrote for his outcomes. He obtained clinical recovery in about a third, amelioration of symptoms in another third, and no result in the remaining third. So just to go back to our sort of historical context that we're going to touch on more in a minute, we now have development and, and someone publishing results from a procedure he developed that he's basically saying for, for these chronic refractory populations, two out of three may get some benefit. By the way, the intervention is harmless and no one becomes worse. So just keep this in mind. He finds that uh, with the alcohol injections, dehydrated alcohol injections, he performs for about the first nine patients. Some don't take as well. So he develops uh, this procedure that is, uh, he calls the leucotomy and uh, introduces, develops uh, the surgical device called the leucotomy, which is essentially this cannulated device. It has a wire on the front uh, that extends out that he, um, once he enters in to the uh, sort of subcortical areas, will make between six and seven incisions on both sides, um, and begins to perform this procedure in, in Portugal. And 
uh, of note for developing this, he's later awarded the 1949 uh, Nobel Prize. So for his discovery, as, as the Nobel Prize Committee puts it, a therapeutic value of leukotomy in certain psychoses. It is note he shares this with Walter Hess, who worked on sort of uh, investigation, investigating uh, organization of the interior brain and sort of neurofunctionality uh, and inner coordination. So he is awarded this in, in 49, certainly one of the more uh, contentious awards now, but uh, still, still stands. And as we can, we can take into account, as we were talking about, some socio and historical contexts and factors. So like we said, there's now development of this new procedure for something there has not been a, a procedure at this time. Certainly ECT, uh, malarial treatments and the like are coming about. Um, but as he is later writing about that there is perhaps curative potential, this procedure is harmless and something that then can now be used on, on many of these folks who have ended up in, in the asylum. So this is in Europe. If we transition to the US, we have, uh, we have a gentleman, Walter Freeman, is, uh, who will become one of the, the main players in this in the US. Uh, he's an American neurologist and psychiatrist, born late 1800s in Philadelphia. Sorry, there should be a picture there, but it didn't carry through. Um, and of note, during his career, he ultimately co-founds and becomes president of the American Board of, of uh, Psychiatry and Neurology in the, in the 40s. A touch more on his background. So he attends UPenn. He, of course, gets interested in neurology and psychiatry. Uh, has, spends an early years head of a neurology department, becomes medical director, of St. Elizabeth's, which is the, uh, the research uh, laboratories of the Government Hospital for the Insane, the early 20s. And from his experiences there, gets so very interested in this underlying neuroanatomy of psychiatric disease, he pursues PhD training in neuropathology and ultimately uh, gets this. So taking Freeman and going back to our Second International Congress in London, Freeman goes to present a poster on Moniz and Moniz's findings. As is described uh, in several sources, a bit of a chance encounter through uh, the poster presentations, he's actually in the next box, as it is described, so right next to Moniz. The two there strike up a conversation uh, and ultimately uh, a bit of a mentorship from uh, Moniz to, to Freeman. Freeman later remarks that Moniz, as a mentor, is a sheer genius, and I think quite interestingly well, said that it would have been highly unlikely that he would have pursued any sort of psychosurgical intervention, particularly a frontal lobe functionality, uh, if they had not had this sort of meeting. The two after this Congress, this uh, meeting, uh, continue with correspondence and both converge on the idea of psychosurgical treatment uh, for, for patients. Moniz uh, essentially giving the go-ahead, um, saying he should buy such a surgical a lacanum, and uh, that he would be kind of kept up to date on the publications that Moniz uh, makes. Now, knowing that Freeman has no surgical background, he ends up collaborating with the young neuroscientist, uh, Dr. James Watts. Shortly after meeting, a couple months, uh, the two performed the first American lacanum. A patient uh, who was facing institutionalization, uh, Miss Alice Hammett, uh, who had a long-standing history of anxiety, depression, and insomnia. And it's performed in the middle of September of 36, so a few months, uh, less than a year after Moniz performs his first, his first procedure. Of note, uh, Freeman describes after the procedure, which was performed in the morning, by evening she was quite alert, and she had manifested no anxiety or apprehension. Uh, a video that Watts and uh, Freeman make uh, about, about their treatment is, uh, we can see here, from sometime in, it's thought to be the, the 40s, the mid-40s. In the following procedure, the, following the surgeon inserts the leukotome into the brain, brain to penetrate directly through the brain, through the brain, the brain, from, brain, from, brain, brain from one opening in the brain skull, brain skull brain to, the to the other. So, it's just kind of a, a brief idea. Um, what they find in terms of functional outcomes from this procedure, they describe initially as being very excited by the results. They describe a 63% improvement rate with their patients, uh, this is, uh, when we look at for what the actual improvement means, uh, less agitation is what is often mentioned. 23% remain unchanged, 14 worsened. But they're so excited by these results, within two months, they performed another 20 procedures. Keeping in mind, Moniz took another year to get a full total of 20 procedures. 
And within the next two years, the two had performed over 200 such procedures. Now, a large study of, uh, in the early 60s of over 10,000 such uh, standard prefrontal lobotomies, as the techniques are called, which we're going to touch on on the next slide, noted an improvement rate of around 70%. Again, noting a reduction in the affective symptoms that they were having, any sort of agitation. They noted about a 6% mortality rate, a 1% epilepsy rate, and a, about a 1.5% uh, people uh, after the procedure have a marked disinhibition that is chronic. So as, as we see here, uh, this essentially takes off and many are done. Um, this procedure becomes known as the Freeman-Watts standard prefrontal lobotomy. Leuconomy is uh, interchanged with lobotomy by Freeman. So we see essentially he's, they're making two uh, bilateral burr holes, inserting the, the leucotome blindly to the midline, sweeping back and forth to surgically interrupt the white matter tracks of the frontal lobes, as, as it is described. And what this looks like in terms of, of a diagram would be this, uh, the top left being the, uh, the surgical site and the way to, by which to find it, and the bottom right uh, being an actual uh, illustration of, of what was done with the sweeping back and forth or making multiple uh, sort of excisions with the leucotome there. There have been patients um, more recently from a paper done in the 1990s that looked at MRI findings of patients after this procedure. Uh, this is uh, an MRI of such uh, of a patient uh, with a diagnosis of chronic paranoid schizophrenia who had undergone this sometime between the age of 18 and 36. And uh, this is done in the late 90s, published in the early 2000s. And what we see, of course, are these, these large cavitary lesions, uh, basically disrupting the white matter tracts between the frontal cortex and, and the lymphatic system, um, as well as a lot of uh, sclerosis around uh, these sites as well. So we see sort of the outcome, the, the anatomical outcome of this. What is often done at the, the time are, are reports of cases. Uh, coming across this case from uh, March of 1942, case 121, noting uh, this lady before the operation as, quote, forever fighting, the meanest woman. 11 days after the procedure, early April, it is noted that she giggles a lot. So this is, this is essentially what is uh, later kind of, of thought as the outcome uh, for such a procedure. A bit though, talking just a bit about the logistics of the standard prefrontal lobotomy. You need a neurosurgeon, you need a surgical theater, you need an anesthesiologist. These require major medical centers at the time, this require or, uh, academic centers at the time. Freeman's goal, as, as he put it, was that he wanted something that was going to be used uh, in places outside of these major centers. He wanted a procedure that he could take that could be done at places he felt needed it most, these state hospitals, these asylums. So what happens uh, through the mid-40s is what we're going to turn to next, which is development of the transorbital lobotomy. So it was performed uh, in the mid-1930s, mid to late 1930s, uh, by Dr. Fiamberti in, in Italy. It's published about, but not much is made about it until about eight years later when um, Freeman begins to focus on this in around 1945. In what is later described as a moment of insight that he had uh, through later interviews with his son, the two were there in the kitchen. Um, Freeman was going to the freezer at that time, the freezer having large chunks of ice and needing an ice pick to take it out. So as he's doing this, uh, has this moment of insight that perhaps such a device, or something like it, that would, be called, or would ultimately be called the orbit class, could be used for such a procedure. His son says as well that he was so excited at this time, he found a grapefruit, used the um, ice pick itself to try to, to see if he could, if such a thing could be done uh, in working out the model. What ultimately happens as he, as he focuses on this is what has become known as the transorbital uh, leucotomy or lobotomy, as Freeman would call it. What it required um, was ECT to render the patient unconscious or local anesthesia. Uh, this orbital class would be placed uh, essentially under the eyelids at a right angle of the nose, transitioned through uh, 
the bony orbit into the orbital frontal cortex, and then a sweeping motion being used uh, to sever these frontolimbic, frontothalmic uh, connections. He uh, performs the first such uh, transorbital procedure in January of 1946 at his private office in DC. The patient's name was a Miss uh, Sally Ionesco. She was described by all accounts, contemporary and historical now, as a suburban housewife who had been dealing with, uh, for some time, chronic uh, violent suicidality, as, as was described. So this was performed in the office. Her daughter uh, is there, uh, and husband there as well. The daughter is later interviewed and uh, has this to say about the procedure, noting there was nothing afterwards. It immediately stopped. It was just peace. I don't know how to explain it to you. It was like turning a coin over that quick. So whatever he did, he did something right. So just as an idea of the initial, the initial thought, and this was done in uh, the early to mid-2000s, this interview, so we're looking at, you know, 50-ish years later. The procedure itself, uh, Freeman makes a, a video, and we'll see an excerpt of this. It is narrated by him, and it is, the procedure is performed by him. The operator lifts the operator upper eyelid, lifts the upper inserts eyelid, the locotome into the conjunctival sac, sac, and aims it parallel with the bony ridge, ridge of the nose. He drives the point through the orbital plate, the orbital plate and at a depth of five centimeters, five swing the handle far laterally. far laterally. So, we see it's done rather quickly. It is noted in multiple accounts that he does multiples, uh, of, or will do multiples of these uh, at, at a time. And he and Watts have diverging opinions on this new procedure that uh, he has developed. Watts having multiple uh, objections morally and procedurally to what's going on. So the two part ways sometime in the late 40s. Um, Freeman after this essentially goes on the road. He begins to tour and show his procedure at these state uh, psychiatric facilities. The, he has now developed this procedure he has been thinking about for so long. To this point, as we alluded to earlier, there is rapid growth of this procedure. To give you an idea, between 1940 and 44, almost 700 such procedures, lobotomies, standard prefrontal lobotomies, are performed. After development of this in 1945, within the next essentially four to five years, over 5,000 such procedures are performed. Two years later, we have over 18,000 such procedures done. Just to, to represent this graphically, in a period of seven years, this is the, this is the use of such a procedure. So, it gets out and it gets performed. Um, Freeman does many of these, as, as we will see. A touch about his career. He charged $25, which is adjusted to around $270 uh, for each procedure. Uh, he performed upwards of about 34, 3,500 such procedures in over 23 states. And over 2,500 of these used uh, the transorbital approach, again noting no, uh, no prior formal surgical training. A couple other contextual factors that I think are important. It is uh, very often remarked there was no sterile technique ever used uh, when he was performing this procedure or with the, the implements themselves. Unfortunately, 19 minors underwent the transorbital procedure, the youngest of which uh, was four years old. And it is often noted he had a, a bit of a showman side to him and this led to some unfortunate consequences, as we see in 1951. Um, in the middle of such a procedure, he stopped for a photo opportunity when the orbital class then, uh, as he was taking the picture, penetrated too far into the patient's skull, uh, and the patient uh, died uh, within the next several minutes afterwards. So ultimately, given uh, how often he's doing these, how readily he's doing these, this, this showman side, things uh, come to, to a head. Um, in the late 60s. Uh, there's a patient, Ms. Morrison, who's undergoing her third such lobotomy, uh, who died of a cerebral hemorrhage. It's been calculated, uh, just as a side note, upwards of 100 individuals uh, died um, from Freeman's procedure, the ones that he himself was doing. And shortly afterwards, Freeman lost his ability to perform such surgical procedures. 
he does, uh, in the years afterwards, make a, a small uh, kind of private practice, but mainly travels around the country following up on these patients who had had such a procedure until he dies in, in May of 1972. By all accounts, by him, uh, by family, by other folks, he was a firm believer in the effectiveness of this procedure that he had developed, which is why he traveled around trying to collect, it as, as they say, evidence um, to help convince other people. With the, the decline and demise of Freeman, so does uh, psychosurgery in a large sense as well. There are a number of very common criticisms uh, that are made of the procedure, relapses, uh, is sort of psychiatric symptoms return quite commonly uh, after periods of, of weeks to months uh, to years, leading to need for repeat operations, uh, upwards of a 15% mortality rate um, for more recent uh, studies. And often it's noted that uh, patients afterwards have a very childlike demeanor that is, is chronic. Uh, we know as well essentially what we're doing in sort of functional neuroanatomical sense. You're severing these sort of frontal uh, white matter tracks. So we in a sense are developing a bit of a frontal lobe syndrome, decreased attention, that disinhibition that is noted in many patients, inappropriate behavior, as well as development of uh, seizures and epilepsy. Um, contemporary to Freeman doing these procedures, there are a number of, of medical criticisms. Uh, this is from a Swiss publication in 1947. As they say, it's still too imperfect to yet venture on a general offensive against chronic cases of mental disorder. Um, it is failed to discover its precise indications and contraindications. And the methods must unfortunately still be regarded as rather crude and hazardous in many respects. So, we, we see, again, sort of building uh, criticism within, within the medical community itself, as well as some very notable uh, people and personalities who uh, underwent the procedure who suffered, unfortunately, kind of tolls of doing such. One um, unfortunate individual being Miss Rosemary Kennedy of Kennedy fame, sibling to uh, the soon-to-be President Kennedy, who underwent such a procedure in 1941, was noted afterwards uh, to be like a two-year-old child. Uh, after the procedure had significant problems with dysfluency, with ataxia, um, and with incontinence that proceeded uh, for, for quite some time and still kept this childlike demeanor uh, afterwards requiring, uh, for all intents and purposes, institutionalization. Now, concurrently with all of this, uh, certain countries, the USSR, banned this on moral grounds. Japan followed shortly thereafter. Um, there is also development in the 50s of pharmacologic therapies, uh, chlorpromazine, in the early 50s, tricyclic antidepressants later. And in this whole brewing pot is a greater uh, cultural and societal awareness of this procedure, what, it's, uh, what and whom it's being done, and some of these very negative outcomes. This is reflected in media at the time, as early as the 40s with publications by Robert Penn Warren, Tennessee Williams mentions this in some of his plays and has some with a, a plot revolving around this. And I think most notably, probably to everyone here, is Ken Casey's book in the early 60s that is later turned into the movie, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, referring uh, to such a procedure as frontal lobe castration. Ultimately, there is a presidential committee that meets uh, in the 70s uh, that uh, looks at such a procedure. And I think quite interestingly, Ultimately, they endorse its continued, very limited use. As well, something we're just going to briefly touch on is the ethical considerations for such a procedure as it was used. Uh, this is something the entire grand rounds and, and more can, can be made of. But questions as to informed consent um, of the patient, of the family, the actual sort of therapeutics of this is, as well are, are things that need to be taken into account. And this is reflective in more modern approaches, or psychosurgical approaches. So if we can transition then on to modern, or perhaps postmodern, if we want to include the, the free frontal lobotomy as such. Um, modern approaches are used at a very limited number of centers, particularly mass gen here in the US. It involves a very multidisciplinary approach involving psychiatrists, psychologists, neurologists, neurosurgeons uh, as a multidisciplinary functioning team. The selection of patients is highly limited, looking for the most uh, severe, refractory, and chronic 
uh, individuals to be considered for selection for such a procedure and that se the severity must be very marked in terms of their own subjective distress and sort of uh, functioning in general. Further taken into account before selection would be uh, basically treatment options, pharmacologic trials, psychotherapeutic trials, as well as other augmentary procedures, transcranial magnetic stimulation, for example, or ECT. Uh, what Mastin uh, mentions on their side and looking for particularly would be chronicity of at least a year without uh, improvement in symptoms, but more practically for the patients who this procedure is used on is over five years. Severity is now evaluated by uh, various scales, OCD for the Y box, needing to be at least above 20, that depression inventory over 30, and when used, the global assessment of function need to chronically be below 50 for even consideration for such a, a procedure. Uh, the diagnoses are also highly limited for their use, OCD being one of the most common, some affective disorders, primarily major depression, uh, all of these being you know, refractory, occasionally bipolar depression has been looked and, and studied, um, combinations of uh, sort of generalized anxiety, depression, OCD are still generally considered surgical candidates. Now, in terms of, of contraindications, uh, there are some that are, are rather significant, any sort of personality pathology. It's considered a contraindication. Substance use, in general, is considered a contraindication, though there has been some research in other countries about psycho psychosurgical um, uses uh, on people with substance use that, um, to the best of, of what I can find, have not penned out in any sort of significant form. And I think most notably, compared to historical uses, schizophrenia is not an indication for such uh, a procedure. Uh, just a moment on sort of the referral process. It has to be done by their own... Uh, primary psychiatrist, everyone has to be of legal age, over 18. The patient and his or her family are involved in a very intense, uh, extensive informed consent process, as well as a detailed record review, talking about the things we were just talking about, medications, psychotherapeutic interventions, and, and other treatments. Um, if, through this referral process, they're thought to perhaps be a candidate, they then meet with this multidisciplinary group um, for basically further processing, further workup, involving anything from further imaging, EEGs, neuropsychological testing, as well as, as anything else that may thought to be contributing or perhaps primary cult etiology. Uh, of note as well, it requires unanimous agreement within the multidisciplinary group um, before the patient can be considered and that there must be uh, extensive family emotional support an agreement to follow up after such a procedure, as opposed to before when it was just sort of a unilateral decision off of, of, one, of one person. Now, the, the neurosurgeries themselves um, kind of developed concurrently after the development of the standard prefrontal lobotomy in the 40s as ways of trying to refine its use, targeting specific areas, and minimizing side effects. Uh, there are four primary such approaches that have evolved. We'll talk about three of them. Uh, given time constraints and how often they're used. They're both performed bilaterally and stereotactically, meaning uh, through use of imaging to, to get us uh, the exact anatomical targets. Um, the four procedures we're referring to are, are these, an anterior cingulotomy, a subcaudate tractotomy, a stereotactic limbic uh, leucotomy, three of which we're going to go into some detail soon uh, in the next series of slides, as well as an anterior capsulotomy that we uh, will not be touching on, but just want to include it as a sense of, of uh, completeness. Now, the anterior cingulotomy has been uh, the surgical procedure of choice in North America for the last three decades, performed extensively at, at Mass Chin, as well as a, a couple places in Canada, or one to two. Uh, its indications are primarily uh, OCD, major depression, chronic anxiety, as well there have been some cases it's been used in cases of essentially chronic refractory pain. So we see with the MRI findings here, um, the central targeted area is the anterior uh, cingulate cortex. And a note real quick on the, the procedure. So the central general guidelines of, of, of where they're targeting that is then supplemented by um, neuroimaging and a lesion of about eight to 10 millimeters uh, is made in the area of the anterior cingulate gyrus and the cingulate bundle. Um, of note, there have been a couple studies I have come across that actually said typically even smaller lesions can be as effective 
if they're a bit more post, if they're placed more posteriorly uh, in the anterior cingulate gyrus. Ultimately, when the procedure is performed, if we look at another cut, we see our, our lesions that have developed uh, in this area. Now, to talk about the functional outcomes of such a procedure, uh, what I think is, is quite interestingly, there's often an immediate reduction in anxiety symptoms. There can be a bit of a latency of up to three months, excuse me, for depression and OCD symptomatology. If after a period of six months to a year, there have not been improvements, the patient can then be uh, considered for a reoperation to enlarge uh, the lesional areas. Now, in terms of actual studies looking at these functional outcomes, the data is pretty limited for all of these. Uh, the numbers aren't huge, and there's certainly some, some concerns as to how the information was made. Typically, it is by structured interview and also by family and patient questionnaires, at least for, for most of these studies. Um, so we see in this, this study in the late 80s of about 200 patients, a 60 uh, 2% uh, patients with depression and bipolar depression were found to have a worthwhile improvement. 56% um, for OCD, about half for uh, non-OCD based anxieties it was described found to be functionally well. Another about 30% with a marked improvement. A follow-up study primarily for OCD in the 30s, noted, or, sorry, uh, with an end of 33 in the early 90s had about a, a 25 to 30% improvement. And again, just to, to hit back the home in terms of difficulties there in these studies, some variation in, in what is uh, defined as improvements, not necessarily using you know, psychometric testing, like your um, obsessive compulsive scale, your YPOC, your VEC inventory uh, indices, that sort of thing. Uh, some of the newer studies do have that, which we'll touch on here in just a couple of slides. Um, so in terms of adverse events, uh, with over 800 singulotomies with the, the mass gen data, so they put no deaths, no infections, two subdural hematomas, one that led to permanent neurological impairment, but was early on in the series, as they mentioned, uh, perfecting what they were doing. Um, interestingly, uh, an early analysis of about 34 patients showed an improvement um, in essentially IQ scores uh, after the procedure, though I was unable to find what the actual gains uh, were. Uh, but this is, this is mentioned. Um, so if we look as well at our next procedure, just to kind of compare, uh, the sub uh, subcaudate tractotomy. It was developed in uh, the UK in the 60s, again with that goal of sort of minimizing uh, the effects from the standard prefrontal lobotomy. It's been used there primarily uh, for obsessive compulsive disorder, major depression, and anxiety. It is a bit of a different approach um, in that they don't necessarily uh, go in to thermocoagulate and make a lesion. They instead implant uh, a bit of yttridium-90, a radioactive uh, substance, um, in the area of essentially the substantia nominata below the head of the caudate to interrupt uh, these white matter tracks. The targeting areas, if we were to look on imaging, we can see uh, within our circles here uh, that these, this would be the, uh, the surgical target for uh, implanting uh, the eutridium that is uh, used in the procedure. Functionally, in terms of outcomes, um, again, this study of about 134 patients at a two and a half years found a response rate from structured interviews close to 70% for depression, a little over 60% for anxiety, and 50% for OCD, and this being done in 1975. More recently, a follow-up from uh, the main unit in London that performs these procedures by a, a self-reported questionnaire, 40 to 60% of the little over 300 patients reported that they live normal or near normal lives, perhaps with the continuation of the medication that they were on. Most notably as well, uh, they mentioned that there is a reduction from, in the suicide rate to 1% post-operation, which they cite from internal um, material uh, that before the operation, these patients typically have a 15% uh, suicide rate. So what they mentioned is a, is a quite marked reduction. In terms of adverse events from this procedure as well, uh, commonly transient disinhibition can occur for a period of multiple weeks after the procedure. A little over 2% developed seizures. Um, 
another almost 7% as they put desire, or develop undesirable personality traits. Um, and they note one death uh, has occurred in the course of this, of this procedure, um, which was from an improperly placed uh, chip with the eutridium that ultimately migrated to the area of the hypothalamus um, that caused its destruction and, and uh, unfortunately to the death of the patient as well. Also citing their 1% uh, suicide risk here. Now, this goes to our, our uh, last procedure that's commonly used, the stereotactic limbic leucotomy, developed in the 70s uh, to target uh, OCD symptoms, and it's actually a combination of the first two procedures. And what we see, again, is kind of uh, this interruption of the white matter frontolimbic, frontothalamic tracts. So again, if we look on MRI, the areas of these circles are what uh, would be considered as targets um, for, for its use. Um, and typically this is done with just uh, lesions, thermocoagulation as the, as the way of targeting these areas. Uh, the functional outcomes for this, uh, again, the numbers themselves are quite low. Um, but at a period of a little over two years, uh, depression, there was about a 33% response rate that was uh, cited as a 50% reduction in their back depression inventories. And this is from a, a early 2000, 2002 study. OCD, 15%, uh, uh, or sorry, not 15%, but 15 patients uh, included in the study. And if we look, about 11 achieved a response rate on average of about 28, 29% reduction in their Y-box scores. So some effectiveness. There's been further follow-up for obsessive compulsive disorder in another more longitudinal study from Mass Gym. Uh, that was published in, I believe, 2013. They looked at 64 patients with refractory OCD. Refractory OCD in this study uh, was defined by three SSRI trials, including promipramine, two trials with augmentary agents, including clonazepam, lithium buspirone, uh, any of the antipsychotics first or second generation. All of these taken for at least a period of 10 weeks um, without any sort of significant effect. In addition, at least 20 hours of psychotherapeutic interventions with a focus on uh, exposure therapy had also to be performed for consideration uh, for such an intervention. As we see, at a period of about 11 months, there was a little over 40% response rate of both full and partial, full being over a 35% reduction in YBOC, uh, and partial being 25 to 34%. At the last follow-up for the study, which was a little over five years, 47% had that full reduction and 22% with a partial reduction. So kind of in brief, um, we see with these procedures, there is some efficacy. Though again, um, with some of the older studies, there's kind of a question as what it actually is defining these sort of functional outcomes. Um, so perhaps some use, though again, as we see in terms of adverse uh, consequences, there can be some significant risk. So uh, briefly, since we're, we're getting finished, um, wanted to touch on deep brain stimulation, which is a, a relatively new approach developed in the late 80s um, that uses implantation of electrodes in the brain to uh, making us small electrical currents. There has been some uh, debate, as, I, as far as I can tell from my, my review of the literature, as to whether or not to actually classify this as a, a form of psychosurgical intervention or neurosurgical intervention for psychiatric disorders. What we see... Um, though, is that it has been very effective. It is uh, FDA approved for OCD in 2009. It's also uh, been helpful for essential tremor, Parkinson's, and dystonia. And there are, uh, as best as I can tell, uh, active areas of research extensively in major depression as well as helping in areas of chronic pain. Uh, on a quick note for OCD, um, so approved in 2009, and as we mentioned before, it's been very helpful in elucidating some of the underlying pathways uh, for OCD, particularly hyperconnectivity, hyperactivity of these sort of uh, frontal limbic uh, areas, as well as understanding that not only is it hyperactivity and hyperconnectivity, but also a, a lack of inhibition on, on certain parts of these striatal areas which uh, the striatal areas, by the way, are the place, uh, the FDA approved sites um, for surgical intervention. Now, if we look into that though, um, these striatal areas, there are about five uh, primary targets that are, that are used. Uh, there's a, a large sort of 
a review in 2014 of 25 studies uh, in of about uh, 100, of 110 patients um, targeting these different areas um, that we'll see kind of on the MRI on the next slide. But the anterior limb of the internal capsule, the nucleus accumbens, uh, the ventral striatum and ventral capsule, the subthalamic nucleus, as well as the inferior thalamic peduncle, which noting the inferior thalamic peduncle, we've got a very low N of six, and this will be important in just a slide or two when we talk about the results. But just to give you an idea of the locations of these anatomical targets in the striatum, if we look, if I can get my mouse right here, uh, the nucleus accumbens, the anterior limb of the internal capsule, the ventral striatum, uh, the bed of the stereo terminalis, the inner thalamic peduncle, and um, the subthalamic nucleus here. All of these being uh, target areas that have now been approved for uh, refractory OCD. The outcomes, as the review article puts, I think quite well, despite the anatomical diversity of these targets, these uh, separate areas, um, the outcomes have all been fairly well. Uh, if we note in general, for most of them, about a 50% response rates with a Weibach reduction of about 40%. The subthalamic nucleus, a little bit higher, uh, bordering on 60% with about a 50% reduction. And I think most interestingly here, with our, inner, um, our inferior uh, thalamic peduncle, they noted at a period of even 36 months, 100% response rate in terms of the individuals who went this, underwent this procedure with a mean reduction of 82.5% in their um, Y box, their OCD scales. Limited though by that really low number of, of, of N being six. Uh, interestingly, and kind of finishing up, uh, in terms of adverse events, two uh, seizures related after this, three intracerebral hemorrhages from the actual procedure itself. Uh, in terms of uh, outcomes from the device, there was a dysthesia that was reported, as well, and I think quite interestingly, battery failure of the stimulator itself led to a number of uh, psychiatric symptomatologies, mood disturbances, panic attack, sense of restlessness, fatigue, or SI that uh, often were resolved when the battery was, was replaced. Uh, this also leads to another area of uh, stimulation mediated adverse events as we see a kind of wide variety of symptoms from anxiety uh, to hypomania, depression and suicidality, as well as uh, cognitive concerns, particularly with that of memory and concentration, uh, that were all typically mediated in some form by uh, generally an overactive or uh, too high of a stimulatory level that resolved typically when um, the level was decreased. Of note, uh, the authors report that with the depression and suicidal ideation, uh, a number of these patients, um, which they did not give, but said that uh, there could have to be a confounding factor as many of them had depression and voice suicidal ideation beforehand. Um, so it's to a question of how much of this may actually be mediated by, by the device. So in closing, um, we can see from the history of psychosurgery and intervention, there's been a bit of a checkered, a checkered pass. Um, though not to entirely throw the baby out with the bathwater, some of these modern procedures have, as we see, uh, been shown to have some form of, of results and fair results uh, for patients who can be effectively selective and those with the most treatment refractory uh, conditions. As well, um, deep brain stimulation appears to be a pretty promising uh, development that could be used for a number of these uh, refractory conditions, most notably now uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. And so in closing, a couple of acknowledgments. I'd like to thank Dr. Moore for his mentorship uh, with developing this presentation. Uh, my wife as well for putting up with me in the process of making this presentation. And a thanks for everyone here for uh, showing up and, and listening to this talk. I really appreciate it. And with that, I'd like to, and we've got not too much time. I was hoping we could open up maybe for a bit of discussion. Uh, I know a couple of the residents have run into someone who had a, a lobotomy. So any sort of, uh, since we've got such experience in the room, interaction uh, with such patients. And since we've only got a few minutes as well, we'll open up to any questions, comments, and the like, as well ending on a slightly lighter note of this uh, great mathematical proof that I, that I came across. So um, I thank you very much for your attention. And I'll turn it over if anybody has any other questions or concerns. So thank you. I just want to tell you a little anecdote. I was um, 
able to send a patient to Brown University for the deep, um, the equivalent of a lacotomy, but done by stimulation, where you you you, you paralyze the the pathway, which would be the same as um, the old procedure of cutting. But the beauty of it was that it, you you didn't do damage, and you could stop the stimulation if if uh, need be. But the anecdote is that the patient was kept there for a few weeks, which was the procedure for patients after they had the uh, stimulation started. And he did extremely well. This was a young man in his 30s who was being taken care of by his mother like he was a baby. He couldn't get out of the bathroom in the mornings. He couldn't clean. He couldn't do anything. She would have to actually do his hygiene to get him moving. And he was turned into someone who was living a pretty normal life in the um, hospital where the uh, procedure was done. And so I was looking forward to seeing him when he came back. I was working in Georgia at the time. And I was really excited and so on. And he came in and I looked at him and he was just like he was before I sent him there. Disheveled, um, uncommunicative and a very concerned mother. And, and I said, what has happened? You know, it, 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 was he not better than this? Anyway, to get to the point of the story, what had happened was uh, when we checked his um, stimulator and everything that we were supposed to do on a follow-up visit, nothing was working. And the reason was when he went through the airport, the security system switched everything off. And the poor man had been living for several weeks thinking that his treatment had failed. And uh, when we were able to reinstitute the treatment, it began again. And so it was a very, almost a, a research study to see what happens when it's turned on and what happens when it turns off. So it, it definitely works. And it's um, the equivalent, I think, of the old lobotomy is just blocking that pathway in a different uh, system that's much safer. Absolutely. I think it, it goes to show, like you're saying, the effectiveness of it, but then also the effects of something when you have a device failure like that, how market of a change of a decompensation uh, that, you can, that you can have, like night and day, it sounds like. Um, the que so, I don't know if, if the mic was on, but the question was about the thalamic peduncle, if any of the cases had had chronic pain. And I'm not aware that, um, that they were. Um, they were, it was simply the site that had been selected for that group that they were targeting that with these patients with refractory OCD. So, but I, I had seen uh, some illusion within the literature of, of good responses uh, to chronic pain. Uh, with its with its use as to the exact anatomical areas, I'm not sure uh, off the top of my head where they where they were targeting. But they had mentioned um, that there had been s certainly improvement with people who had concurrent chronic pain or depression uh, after undergoing deep brain stimulation for OCD. Uh, so I, I, I don't know if that helps too much, but that's that is what I came across. Well, one of the things that I'm going to discuss next week is the differential between pain and suffering, and I think that the Singulotomies have been sometimes done for chronic pain, but mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. makes sense that the thalamic procedure would be helpful too. I just wondered. Absolutely, I, I, there, and so it had been used, and also the the other procedure we hadn't talked about, which we don't have time for. Um, just a couple extra slides as well, we're to talk about uh, the OCD. But there had been oh well, maybe I don't have it. Um, but the anterior singulotomy had also been used since or uh, caps. So the capsulotomy had been used in cases of chronic pain as well. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for your time, and thank you for being here.